Hi, my name is Keith Pro, and if you're an upcoming artist, you should definitely watch Go Produce. Yes, yes, my smartest. This is Keith Pro. He has loved music more than anything since he was a baby. He was jumping in and out of bands since he was 16, but he never really found his true calling behind the microphone. What he did was he started managing his friend's bands and he was handling all of the behind the scenes work. Although he was never satisfied, Keith started a fanzine to find more great music and he reviewed hundreds of bands' demos, offering them straightforward tips on how to get to the next level in their careers. He was signed on to be a promoter for a couple of them, eventually turning it into a full-time booking agency. This and more laid the foundation for indie band guru, Smartis. This is Keith Pro. Oh, very glad to be here. Thank you, Big Lou, for the great introduction and some good backstory of my long and winding career. Thank you. <laughs> it is a very long and winding career, but there's a lot of wisdom in it, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to extract it all from you, at least to the best of our ability. That makes sense? Plug in and take what you need. <laughs> I love to <laughs> right, share. Well, I love to share what I learned along the way. It's, you know, one of the passions of why I'm still in this business, just to help those independent artists that, you know, didn't have to go through all the trials and tribulations that I've been through. So, it's so critical and and thank you. Thank you for doing that. I'm here to listen and to learn. With that, let's jump right into our first segment. The first segment is called The Basics. That's the basics from the featuring Grumpy Sound Guy. I hope you I hope you like that. <laughs> what we're doing in the basics is ultimately <laughs> Grumpy Sound Guy really likes his own work. Yes. But what we're going to do in the basics here is just understand you a little bit better. Why did you choose music over anything else? It was a passion from when I was a child. I mean, I, my mother tells a story that I used to lay on the floor and just while she would spin a Pink Floyd record and just lay on the shag carpet and just stare into the ceiling and absorbing the music. And I think it started from there and just kind of it's something that just means a lot to me and no matter what it is and i've tried as you mentioned i've tried you know being on the band side was in a few relatively successful bands but just never really found that calling as a musician but i always like the other side so here we are can you can you tell us a little bit more about that turning point that's almost like you knew it was music that part was inevitable right but as you experimented more you realized that the stage, the microphone, wasn't it, was it a specific event that happened or was it someone's like, ah, maybe you should try this. And they brought it to your attention. How did that unfold? Ah, uh, the long story short is just, um, one of my bands that I probably did the best with the band called the Lush Puppies. And, you know, we were based in New York and we went up to as far as Buffalo and as far down as Florida. So we did an East coast tour and that was, yeah. you know, fun to do and great to do. And I realized that this was probably 20, 21 years old. So, you know, we were used to having fun and having a good time, but I was the guy that also did all the work. I was booking all the shows. I was doing all the setting up all the radio interviews when we got to town and kind of doing everything, doing all the promotion. And this is, you know, not to date myself, but before it was a lot easier with the internet. So a lot of phone calls, a lot of busy work. And I just kind of, I didn't hate it, you know? And right. the other, the other side of that is that, um, basically I saw some reviews of, yeah, that, um, cause I was singing at one point, which I was never a good singer, but I was just the guy that would, was willing to get in front of the, in front of the microphone while the other guys were back there. And then I was playing keyboards and I would see reviews of like, yeah, the band's good, but that singer just, he could use some work and it's kind of hurt, but at the same time gave me that kind of guidance of where I should be. So that was kind of the tipping point, I guess, but. You know, it's, it's a tough, tough to understand when I got the appreciation on the other side of doing all the work, like I, the guys in the band were great and they were hard workers as well, but yeah. they, they appreciated what I was doing as I saw in a million other bands where it's just one guy doing everything and all the other guys just lounging around and living the dream, you know, that rock star lifestyle. But yeah, you know, I can't take that from my band. They were great, but you know, they appreciated what I was doing. Which is, which is, you know, crucial in order for a successful band to be, or for a band to be successful. When you were the band leader though, did you, how did you, especially since you were doing a lot of the administrative work, how did you split the equity or, or like 
your revenue. Was that ever an issue? Yeah, no, it never got to that much revenue. So that was the problem. But most of what we were making was just being poured back in right away as far as like right. we, wanted, we wanted to go on those little tours. So, you know, we'd make good money at a hometown show and then we'd just pour that into, okay, we're going to spend that money going on tour. So it was never that much, you know, it was never the only job either. So there was always something else all of us were doing. So it was more of a fun, but let's see how far we could take it kind of thing. Fair. And then, okay, so say, hypothetically, you did take it to the next level and you were earning more money, or there's another band that's doing that. Do you think that the band leader should typically earn more equity that's, or should have more equity? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult question because it's going to be different with every band. And like right. I said, if someone's doing all the work and the guys are basically hired guns just to come play music, yes, they shouldn't get as big a cut. But if it's three guys that are three or four guys that are writing music together you know, doing the, never mind the admin work, but doing the, the music work, the promotion work, I feel it's fair to split it all. But that's, like I said, that's kind of going to happen specifically in every case, I believe. So because it's specific, it's probably best that the band should have this conversation ideally earlier on once they establish themselves, like, hey, these are our goals. This is what we're working towards. Or like, let's do something and then we'll talk about that later. Like, that's probably yeah, I'm all for, get, for getting getting things done as soon as you decide to get things done that you know that's yeah. one of my focuses with a lot of the bands I work with is just getting that foundation set in every piece of it like you said from the splits from the songwriting splits is another big thing you know on the other side of it you know when you're writing songs who's going to get the piece of the royalties on each of that but to take that back a second it's I think you have that conversation and that's when you got to kind of get to know each other as a band and like each other because bands that don't like each other usually don't work out. Let's never mind Oasis, but <laughs> bands that don't like each other as friends, it's a difficult job. It's not an easy gig. So you have to kind of have fun with what you're doing, have fun, the people you're with. So that's when you have those conversations at the beginning where after, you know, you practice for an hour and a half, hang out for another hour and a half, you know, maybe having a couple cocktails and talking about the the goals of the band. Uh, you know, you want everyone to be on that same page of what are our goals because different goals are fine for different people. It's okay to just be a hometown band and, you know, make money on the weekends. But that same guy being in a band with another guy that wants to tour the world, that's not going to work in the long run. It's just going to fall apart. So, yeah, you have to lay that foundation of what everyone wants to do right from the start. And that leads to what the cuts will be right from the start as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great question or a great response. Thank you for that. That was a good question. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, we, we've already established, you've got quite the history in the music industry. Now, I'm hoping that you can share with us the first lesson that came to light when you first started this whole pursuit. Um, that's another you've got all the difficult questions today, Lou. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's been such a revolving and fluid kind of growth in the industry. Because like, like I mentioned, it was never a, this is all I do all day, all my time. And this is how I'm going to make my income. Because we could all face facts. There's not much income in music at the beginning, at least. So you kind of have to be doing something else. And 100%. Okay. And you got to be okay with that. And that's, you know, that's what one of the other little tidbits is you got to accept that, that day job and use it as number one, motivation. And number two, a great place to make contacts for those early people that had come to your shows. Because all those people at your day job that just, you know, no matter what you're doing, you know, typing, sitting at a computer, they kind of have in the back of their head that I want to be a rock star lifestyle. So it's easy to get those guys to come out to a show and stuff. So use that. <laughs> but yep. now back, back to the question of where did it kind of go? The first lesson. Like your first lesson. Yeah, yeah. The first lesson is more of, I kind of brought up right away is get everything kind of get everyone on the same page. You know, that's because we huh. I've had bands where, you know, on the, when I was starting to manage bands, had a great, great band out of Connecticut and, you know, phenomenal music. The music was there, which is always going to be the first thing, you know, make sure the music is there. That's lesson number one, but have everyone on the same page. And I had a great um, relationship with two people from the band that were, you know, they were in their low twenties at the time. So a little more mature. The other two band members were, I think, 19 and 20. So had a great relationship with the older guys and they were all gung ho and this is what we were going to do. And, you know, we were signing a contract to do, do a lot of things. And then as these things were coming to, to fruition, 
the other two guys in the band were just, well, no, I can't do that. Like, I can't disappear for a week. I can't. And it was just like a punch in the gut. It's like, well, I thought we were all, you know, this is what was the goal. But like I said, you got to get everybody's goal in a band. I mean, it's yeah. different with a singer songwriter that, you know, hopefully they can tell you exactly what they want. But yeah. with a band, it becomes a little tough sometimes. But Multiple even, moving parts. Yeah, that's it. Even, even with, a, with a solo artist, you have to kind of be honest with yourself because I've had this situation too where the artist, just me and one artist and an artist out of Pennsylvania, kind of like country pop, which wasn't really my flavor, but she had such a like great music and just a great attitude toward it. And the same thing. It's like, this is what we're going to do. And yes to death, you know, yes to me to death. Yes, I want to do that. Yes, I want to do this and let's do it. And then things kept getting in the way. She had, she had another job. She was a personal trainer. So that would get in the way for some weeks and she had a family life and she let these things get in her way when to me, and when we were having a conversation, nothing was going to get in the way and everything that came right. up, we were going to go and move forward. So, you know, kind of getting so the goal. So did you stop working with her? Um, yes, we, we bracked it into a kind of a lesser phase, I would guess. Yeah, I no, no names, but like, just so <laughs> artists realize, like, these people aren't just gonna sit around waiting for you to eventually do your work. Stay true to your word, just do what you're gonna say, or do what you say you're gonna do. And then people will like, work with you. Wow. It's that simple. It's not easy, but it's that simple. Yeah, simple is yeah. a simple is a tough word. I wouldn't even use that word because there's times <laughs> with all of us that we have in our head what we want to do and what we plan on doing and all the stuff we're going to do. But then when it comes to fruition, some of us, you know, you get a little um a little scared and you got to power through yeah. that fear and do what you want. <laughs> but like if you're not scared, are you experiencing new fully? Yes. And if you're not experiencing new, are you making the most of this life. I don't know, to each their own, whatever whatever they're happy with. But if you're actually trying to pursue a career in music, you have to be okay with being comfortable and pushing that limit. If not, please, please try something else. Exactly. Like be happy with whatever you're doing, but know that this is, this is uncomfortable. Oh yeah, it's not gonna be easy. And you gotta take that. That's one of my first conversations with any artist I work with is it's not going to be easy. And I'm gonna give them a lot of work to do. And they have to know right away that the work's coming and I expect it to be done. Otherwise, you know, this isn't going to work. So I like, to, cha issues, I, I like yeah. to challenge my artists right away now. But that's something also I've learned. Instead of just trying to be the, the friend with an artist I work with, you got to kind of be the kind of be the jerk of the band too. There's always that one jerk in the band. I, I'll, I'm willing to be that jerk because it'll get things moving faster, whether that's going to be yeah. to right off the cliff or to success. You know, it'll get things moving in the right direction a lot quicker when you have someone pushing you. Right. Everyone has their place. Very integral. Yes. Awesome. If you could change one thing about the music industry, what would you change? It's starting to change. I believe what I would like <laughs> to see change is, but that, okay. that stranglehold that the like mainstream has had for so long on what we get to hear. I mean, music can get out there now. It's a beautiful thing. Any, any one of us could record a track and put it up on Spotify tomorrow. Getting people to listen yep. to it, that's a whole nother mission. But, <laughs> but there's still, I mean, even like, I, I love Sirius XM satellite radio, but it has become the same 10 songs now, just like mainstream, you know, FM radio used to be. It's just, they push songs that they, who knows how they decided to pick those songs, payola. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> certain songs <laughs> get pushed so hard for no reason. And songs that, you know, music is very to each their own. But songs that just aren't musically even quality songs get pushed so hard sometimes. And you just got to wonder, you know, that's the part of the industry that's just... Why? Yeah, why? <laughs> There's yeah. more more behind this that, you know, we don't want to see the dark side of the music. So, <laughs> No, I, I, I do have to agree. I am seeing some of these kinds of changes happening in terms of like decentralized music platforms. Yes. Um, but we're still early. Um, and I'd like to see to see more, but I'm not confident which direction it's going to go in yet. Right. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. I mean, there is, there yeah. is opportunities. It looks like to have, yeah. you know, the independent industry and the artists take control, but there's still, you know, that big conglomerates up there kind of running, running this, pulling the strings that we're not really able to see yet. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Alrighty. Then, Keith pro. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, and just I almost to, cut you off. To, yeah. Just to add more. I'm always adding more. Don't mind me. 
But just the, I think for a musician, and I've had this realization relatively recently, for a musician or someone that loves music so much and you want to see all that, we're not normal. And by normal, I just mean the average person. The average person is okay with just turning on the radio and listening to those saved 10 songs over and over. And it drives me insane. And it drives a lot of, you know, the music, music lovers I love insane. But mm -hmm. the reality is you, you got to find the people that are looking to help build your career, not just people that want to turn on the radio and hear the same song again. So you can't please them. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. It's part of the journey. You know, it's part of the journey. You have to sift through it all. It's quite interesting. Be willing to do that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, be willing. All right, Keith, we are going into the speed round. The it's the speed round. Speed it's the speed round. round. <laughs> yeah, that was a terrible take. <laughs> Oh, I'm not playing that again. Let me turn that off. All right. What the speed Why round is, Why are you always Keith? looping our transition sounds, man? Get it together. I get nervous. Do you, I don't know. Do you want me to do <laughs> the sound transitions for you? I mean, like, maybe we got to talk about this in the future. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Keith, what we're doing in the speed round is I've got 20 questions that I'm going to be throwing at you at quite rapid succession. You have no more than three seconds to respond to each. And if you go past that three seconds, Mark, the grumpy sound guy is going to hit you with a buzzer. Hit a buzzer. That's the buzzer. I've been buzzed All before. Right? That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, we do have the opportunity to justify any of your responses after the 20 questions. Cool. Gotcha. Do my best. <clears throat> Let's this is, this go. This is the scary part, but I'm ready. <laughs> We're starting. Do you prefer adventure or leisure? Adventure. Do you think artists can tour the world without being signed to a major label? Yes. What is your favorite meal? Hamburger. Simple. Dead or alive, who would you like to have dinner with? Kurt Cobain. What is the tagline for indie band Guru? Get the knowledge to get known. Who is an artist that you currently find the most exciting? Billie Eilish. It was... <laughs> We'll have to come back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> the next round is on me. What are you having? Oh, a Jack and Coke. Keep it simple. What upcoming music conferences are you looking forward to? Um, they're all virtual now, but I'm doing the Singer Songwriter Summit coming up soon, in a couple weeks. Okay. If movie is to watch, Netflix is to? Uh, repeat. If movie is to watch? Watch, Netflix is to? Binge. <laughs> Do you have any nicknames? Uh, I've been called the Guru, obviously. And, the Guru. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the Professor. Keith Pro turned into the Keith Professor sometimes. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you started Indie Band Guru while you were in the Army. Correct. Is this the best interview you've ever had? Of course, yes. Hey! <laughs> what is your favorite activity to do? Listen to music. Simple. Um... Do you still play the keyboard and bass? Uh, I play some keyboard, not bass much anymore. Not bass. Is water wet? It is. Make the first sound that comes to your mind. Blop. <laughs> <laughs> See, sound guy if liked that one. <laughs> he did. He did. <laughs> if you're in the game and you just keep doing it, blank. You'll find success. Yes. Who is your all-around favorite person in the world? My wife. She probably won't what is watch your favorite that, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> Clever response, though. And uh, what is your favorite city? I love New York City. Tell me, can you imagine a world without music? No. I, I've tried, and no. <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not worth it. We made it through the speed round. Pew, 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 pew. That was my transition. I didn't risk hitting that again. <laughs> awesome. Keith, we got, we got one justification. You said uh, Billie Eilish. Just, I don't love, especially her new music, I don't like it too much. But I love the whole branding that she's done and how she's bigger than music. So I do appreciate Billie Eilish, even though my seven-year-old likes the music more than I do. You know, and I think as a music fan, you can appreciate these things about different kinds of artists. You don't have to necessarily like the music, but what they're doing with their careers can be very admirable in, in, in that sense. And other artists, even that aren't in the same genre as, as she would be, can learn from what she is doing. So it's great to like study these kinds of different kinds of artists.
Yeah, I that's I think it's a great point. And I recommend all artists do that is, you know, follow artists that are making a statement. And just branding is key in artists. So like we go back to Billie Eilish. She has this whole like this is who I am, take it or leave it, you know, I'm gonna do what I want kind of attitude. And that works with a lot of people, whether they like the music or not. People want to have that same attitude of, you know, I'm going to do what I want and take it or leave it. This is it. me. Yeah. Yep. This so. is me. That's awesome. Um, indie band guru, you you started this in the army and it's because of the, the uh, video scene, the fan scene, because you were hoping to find a lot of original music because of the area that you moved to. I did a tad of research. Um wow. You know, you weren't exposed to a lot of independent artists there, right? So you were trying to find people from across the country. And that is ultimately how you started Indie Band Guru. Would you, can you like share a couple of tips or maybe challenges that you experienced that someone else perhaps wanting to start something similar might go through? Yeah, well, I'll go through the the story in a little more depth. You did great research though. I'm not going to take that away. (laughs) But I, I was born and raised in New York City. So I kind of took it for granted of like, I can go out any night of the week and go see a, a show any night of the week, you know, go see a band play and, you know, pay f- $5 cover to get in and see music that I never heard before, but it's by four guys that are pouring their hearts out. And then right. when I was in the army, I moved out of North Carolina. It's a very different scene where you were trying to find a show and it was just nothing. You would have to drive into actually, you know, Charlotte was about three hours from where I was uh, Raleigh Durham had a decent scene, but that was about an hour away. So it was, it was difficult. And that's where it became, you know, let's try this internet thing. This is when I started, actually started up as, as no better booking and stuff. I'm talking 15, 18 years ago now. So the internet was a very different place, but at the same time I could put up a page and I just was seeking new music to listen to. And, you know, as you mentioned, submissions just started coming in where to the point where I had to get a PO box because it was just too much mail. And this is back when these things, these little round things called CDs. I don't know if you heard of them anymore, but I was getting CDs in the mail every day. And it was just, you know, I realized there was such a need for people to just listen to music and help guide artists. And that's what it is, you know, as someone looking to do something like that, just find your niche of what you, what you can provide to an industry. You know, whether in music or anything else, you know, find where the part that you enjoy, you know, and see what you can provide to the masses. And, you know, that's where that passion kind of meets rubber meets the road, I guess. The passion meets exactly. what you can do. So, exactly. you know, be that guy. I really like this story because it shows how, despite how saturated the market can be or clearly already is, there is always a little niche that you can find and people will flutter to it because all of these musicians and artists obviously were looking for someone to share their music with and to be written about. So like, it's never too late to start. Just start. It's just a matter of starting. All right. Just, um, just so get thank going. You for sharing that. <laughs> yeah. If you do all something, right. they will come. No, they will. They will <laughs> just do it consistently and do it genuinely. Like, don't just do it for the dollar because people will smell that as well. There is no dollar at the beginning. So that's that's kind of what I try to teach people, too. If, if you're not doing it for the fun of it and like for me, it was it was a hobby, so to speak. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of built from there. So do it for something you're enjoying because, yeah, the dollars come much, much later. Later. I hear that. <laughs> I hear that. All right. Well, on that note, let's transition into what's your take. I think that's my favorite one today. I think that's my favorite one today. But Keith, what's your take? What we're doing is we're opening back up to open discussion. No more quick, um, quick questions. And ultimately, we just want a little bit more of your wisdom. So let me just start with the questions. <clears throat> we learned that you tried your hand out at performing um, and you found that management was more fulfilling. So you gave us a little bit of detail around how your early career was, but I'm curious to know, did your band, did your band members have any kind of tension or turmoil as you were going through this transition? Like trying to picture someone else in your shoes going through this process, what kinds of emotions did they have? And like, 
what kinds of decisions did they have to make to like make sure that they were doing the best for themselves? Does that make sense? Yeah, I believe I hear what you're saying. And it's it kind of became of what I suggest to old man too. You got to kind of be a part of the scene, you know, whether with that, that local scene is, you got to go out to the shows even when you're not playing. So I was doing that and my band members were doing it when they could. So that's where I was meeting other bands and kind of seeing the, the beauty of certain things working better than maybe they were working with my band. And you kind of try to bring that back to your band. And there was no animosity because it was, you know, it was, we were all friends and we're still friends to this day. So that was, you know, not one of those awesome. bad, bad breakups, but it became of like, you know, some people want to take this harder than other people want to take it. So let's kind of just, you know, play for fun when we want, but this isn't going to be the, you know, band going and touring the world anytime soon. And that was okay. Was when you were having that, was that like a one-time sit down conversation? Then you all kind of came to this agreement or was it a dragged three month uncomfortable experience? What did that look like? It, it went slower, but at the same time it was, there was no like, Hey, let's end this today. It was kind of because I started working with some other bands. I was a little less available, I guess. But at the same time, when I was bringing back, Hey, you know, this other band that I, that I'm working with, they're about to do a short tour. You know, we could jump on that if we want. And, you know, other guys couldn't do that. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, you, you take those a, a couple times, but then you just saw the, the divide of, you know, where the, the goals are big. It, it always comes down to goals, I guess, you know, and if the right. goals aren't aligned, you know, let's, let's cut it here. And, you know, like I said, we would still play local shows once in a while, but it was never, we weren't going all out again. And that was okay. Cause that, that became the new goal is to just like, let's have fun. You know, go out right, and playing right. shows and being on stage is, is fun. So, you know, that became the goal of that band. Do you think that there are specific structures within band communication that kind of help make this a smoother process, such as like, let's have weekly meetings outside of our rehearsals, or let's sign an agreement or that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think that stuff should be done, you know, because like I mentioned, you can't just be about the music because even the greatest music in the world, no one's going to listen to if, you know, you're not working hard to get it out there. So you have to have everyone on board. Um, when I work with full bands, I like to kind of set up of you know, well, social media, for example, like one person handles the social media accounts. Like that's their job during the week. Cause right. we're not, you know, we're only playing a couple times a week. So during the rest of the week, I don't want you just forgetting about, you know, your job, this band. So one guy handles social media. One guy will handle email accounts, you know, and just answering one guy will be responding to, you know, um, either like, uh, playlist submissions or trying to handle stuff like that, or getting shows where everyone's got to be working and kind of expanding their network. And that's where it becomes at the end of that week, when you do get together, you have that straight talk. Okay. What did you get done this week? And when the one guy says, oh, I meant to, but I never got to it. You got to have that tough conversation of like, okay, you know, this is your slide week, but next week you got to do double the work to, you know, pull your own weight. And, you know, that's where, like you said, those tough conversations either work out great right away, or they kind of set the tone of like, all right, this isn't going to work. And I'd rather yeah. have a band fall on its face in the first two months than, you know, two years down the road, realize that it's not going to work. Cause that's two years later, yeah. two years of hard work that a few of you have put in and now you're going to be starting from fresh again. So let's get to the point. Yeah. <laughs> how bad do you love this? <laughs> that's awesome. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we, we, we briefly touched on your touring experience from New York to Florida. Um, and during this, you kind of realized that you enjoyed the management side not so much the performing side, but as a group, as a whole group, as a band, what was the greatest challenge that you experienced on tour? Greatest challenge? Um, like maybe it was we ran out of gas so frequently we didn't expect that. Right. Like, just, just the routing whatever. of like how to get to the next town and where are we going to sleep for that night? It was, like I said, this was years ago when it wasn't as simple to just go online and, you know, find Airbnb. an Air Airbnb to stay at. Yeah, that didn't exist back then. 
but just right. find, you know, getting, getting, we just had a van. We would get back in that van and getting to the next town. That was the first step. This is when, before even, uh, you know, simple navigation on your phone too. So that was a challenge in itself, <laughs> but you'd get there yeah. and then finding, you know, getting to that town and kind of let's kind of, whether it be, okay, we, you know, we're here, we, we're not performing. We got here at nine in the morning. We're not performing till nine tonight. Let's kind of take in some of that town, maybe do some promotion. You know, let's get out there, try to meet some people. And that became difficult because it became like a rat race at times where it's, it's like you're rushing to get somewhere and that's like, okay, let's get to work. There's no downtime of, okay, let's just sit around and do nothing. Cause, and that might've been my crazy brain because I'm like, we're here, let's work. This is what we're supposed to be doing. So Let's get out there. Interesting. So take say, so like obviously the work the work drive isn't horrible. Getting out promotion can be fun too, but take some time to recharge. Yeah, exactly. Take that time. Like I, the big thing I like during that tour, especially, is we would usually drive through the night. Like we'd play our show, we'd hang out. You know, at least a couple <laughs> guys would stay sober. So those two guys would, <laughs> would would just drive to the next town that night instead of like crashing at a at a floor that night or finding a cheap hotel that night, let's get to the next town. And, you know, usually it's, you know, down here and during the East coast is not too bad. Usually drives were maybe four five, six hours max. So it wasn't too crazy to drive to the next town overnight. And then you just, right. you get there and then kind of, you know, have that, you get to sleep. You hopefully you find a, a motel over there in the morning, you get a few hours sleep and you wake up and you still have plenty of day to get things done. Right. You know, I, I, something in my personal life, either I hate rushing. So I'd rather be six hours early and have time to waste than, you know, rushing to the next town and like, all right, we got to be on stage in, in an hour. Let's, let's go, let's go, let's go. So, yeah, uh, I think yeah, that's a, nah. still something I try to live by is, you know, get there early so you don't have to rush <laughs> in everything yes. in life, in even with a everything. podcast, you know, I was here. 10 minutes you before were. to make sure that everything was going smooth. <laughs> yes, very much appreciated. We 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 could use that extra buffer of time because we, we have our fair share of technical difficulties. Oh, there will always be difficulties <laughs> in everything. So allow time for those that. difficulties. That's okay. <laughs> I hear that. Yes. Okay. So let's let's talk a little bit more about indie band guru. Um it's an online music magazine. It's got artist development management agency, uh, indie PR firm as well. But no one can talk about it as best as you can. I'm hoping if you can expand on each of the initiatives, maybe some of the services, and we can pick it apart a little bit more from there. Mm -hmm. Well, the main part of the site is still what it began. It's uh, music reviews and interviews. And I still love doing those. You know, I have a team of writers now that helped me, you know, cover so much music. And that's the main part of it. And what we have spun off and really just from seeing the submissions come in, I kind of know what works. I know what a good pitch looks like. I know what a bad pitch looks like when, you know, someone's like, Hey, listen to my music. And I have no idea who they are or whatnot. You know, let's um, be very honest. That email gets deleted very quickly. So it's things <laughs> like that, that I've picked up. And even through the years of just like bands that I've liked, I've taken the time to like, listen, you have great music, but you're doing it all wrong as far as pitching to, you know, get reviews and stuff like that. So that's where it became, I started just helping bands on a, you know, nothing basis just because I like the music. And then it kind of, I realized that there's more and more people that need these kind of services. They just, they just kind of get lost. And it's just, I mean, artists in general, they get so overwhelmed with there's so much to do to build a career besides just making great music, which will always be number one. So I've been able to kind of come in with its bands and kind of lay down a, a basic, a customized, because everyone, every plan is different, but a plan by step by step, I should say, plan that's going to kind of get them to where they are. And that's where the artist development comes in. And at the same time, we work, Indie Band Guru just works with the little guys. I'm not looking for any, you know, giant bands that already kind of made a name for themselves. That's not where I could be the most helpful. I could be most helpful with these smaller bands that have that hard work ethic and are willing to put in the work. So we take them in and kind of run them through a plan. You know, that's where the artist development area is. It's, we don't accept every band because I've come across too many bands that just think they have it all together, but don't. And I'll kind of give them suggestions of what to go do before we can work together. And, you know, that's, you know, that's where the straight talk comes in of, you know, I'd love to work with you, but you're all over the place. So go take some time, get all this stuff, you know, in order and then come back and let's see where we are. 
And, you know, the other, the other side, just to touch on the other main focus of Indie Man Guru now is just independent PR, where we're working with smaller bands and I'm not trying to get them coverage on Pitchfork because that's just not realistic at the very beginning. You know, let's build up that foundation of smaller blogs, smaller radio stations, you know, smaller playlists to build up that kind of buzz going. So now, you know, a year down the road, we search for something bigger. We have, you know, examples of everything we've done already. And it kind of builds from there. But, you know, when you try to shoot for the top right away, you kind of get discouraged when it doesn't happen. But when you shoot, you know, start at the bottom and work your way up, you know, taking those steps up to the top, it works if you're willing to actually, you know, ride it out for the long haul. Not only does it work, but it prepares you for what is coming. Like you cannot, it's not, being at the top isn't healthy for an extended period of time, in my opinion, not that I've been there. But you can't just be thrown at the top and expect to continue to thrive. There is no way, no way, no how you're going to, there's, everything is just different. It's just different. And I couldn't tell you why it's different, but <laughs> there's a reason you have to go through this development process to get there. And it's, it's part of the experience. If you don't want that experience, again, you're probably not doing this for the right reasons. Well, that's I me. Mean. We see how many one hit wonders, you know, over the years that, you know, they had this hit that. It took off and it was great and great for them. And now they're all over the place, but they can't follow it up because they didn't build that foundation of, you know, how to get there. They just kind of got there. And, you know, it's a sad tale of seeing a lot of those bands and, you know, people in regular world think that, oh, they had one hit. They're rich for the rest of their lives. And that is very far from the truth. So when they do uh -huh. go back on those hard times trying to write a song again, you know, there's nothing there to fall back on. It gets scary. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. You said uh, you said you've seen a boatload of submissions. I'm wondering, can you give us a couple of examples of what makes a submission good versus not good, worthy of deleting quickly? Oh yeah. Well, the first thing is what I you know try to teach everyone is in your first contact with me. If we meet personally, it's a little different. But let's say email contact or you know even just reaching out to, through a blog or something. You've seen me. Your first words in the first paragraph to me. I don't even want to know that you have music you want me to listen to. Like try to try to build that kind of personal relationship with somebody and just, you know, what I, I mean, I hate to say I kind of templatized it, but there's a template that we use when we're first reaching out for a new band of just, I love what you do. Well, you know, I'll use you an example. Lil, I'll reach out like, Oh, I saw the go produce podcast, you know, and that first paragraph will be about how much I love you. And that's what makes someone on the other side of the pink kind of take attention. Like, oh, this is someone that actually knows what I'm doing, appreciates what I'm doing, put in the time. And I'm not just some name on some mass list that they sent the same email to a hundred times. Copy, it's paste, just, copy, paste. Yeah. It's yeah. just, it's, I've seen it so many times where they'll like actually include the wrong name in reaching out to me. Cause you know, they just copy pasted and forgot to change something. Uh, they'll use the wrong blog name. I'm like, oh, it just... <laughs> And it's, it happens because they do yeah. try to do it so quick, but yeah. And it's something I, I preach too, is it's, I would rather have, mm -hmm. I'd rather have 50 contacts that know who I am and I have a little relationship with than a thousand contacts that I'm just throwing music at the wall and seeing what's, what sticks. And those 50 will work out with a better result than those 1000 every time I found. So that's what, so take it back to the beginning of the question is get to know someone instead of just spitting your music at them because they get that all day be different than the masses be different yep and 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 one way i like i like those examples one way that i found that has helped me be different um at least on social media because i've received those spam messages spam comments on instagram and whatnot but one trick that i would suggest artists or musicians whatever use on social media to be a little bit different is to send your followers or people that you're messaging a video message sometimes it doesn't go over well because they don't want to listen to it but it's different and more often than not i've actually had people be like hey i actually opened this and responded to you because it wasn't just a text message it was a video message so those little kinds of things work. Oh yeah. I mean, I don't know if you follow Rick Barker and he's another one that talks about that a lot. Um, Instagram, especially <laughs> when you gain a new follower on Instagram, instead of that message, we all see and thanks for the follow, you know, take those five seconds to actually record a video 
And it's just, oh, I just wanted to say thanks. I saw you follow me. You know, it's really appreciated. You know, I'd love to keep you in, in tune with what we're doing next. And you'd be amazed at, you know, building that relationship with a fan, how that become goes so much further than just another number. Yep. So. I've made friends. I mean, like, I call these, I call some of these people friends now, and I've never actually met them in person. <laughs> <laughs> That's the power of the internet. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. But even That's that, it's, it's because, the be especially the beginning of, of a, an artist's career, I'm still trying to coin the word. Maybe you could help me. You're good with wording. But that there's always going to be a, a symbiotic relationship of, of friends and fans. Because those first yeah, fans, symbiotic, are, yeah. Are, yeah, they're going to be your friends. So I don't know, like uh, your fam, family. I'm still trying to work on a word. You know, think of family. that. Family. <laughs> oh, but, I but, see what you're trying to do. I kind of like that. Because those yeah. are going to be people that, you know, you get to know them. And they're going to help you, which is, you know, let's face facts. We're, yeah, we want our fans to kind of be working on our behalf. So of if course. we could kind of just show them some love at the beginning and not that it's phony, but make them think that they're actually a real friend and not to be phony, not to say make them think yeah. it, but it's, it becomes, you know, a landslide because now you go back there and send out an email to your, to your list of friends saying, Hey, we have a show coming up. We could really use everyone to kind of just share it on their social media. And then all of a sudden you, you have, yeah, this giant face and everybody is seeing about your show. You know, that, that speaks volumes, Jens, just because you made a relationship with someone. Yep. Yep. It really does. That's how it works. Um, before we move away from this topic, I, I do have a question um, about the bands themselves. You said that outside of the submission process, bands will do a lot of different things wrong just because they don't necessarily know what to be doing next. Can you maybe give us like the top three um, areas where you see artists making mistakes where they're probably just unaware? Um, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> First one I'm going to say is get everything together right from the start. And what that might mean is determine a band name, you know, what artist name you're going to go under. And right away, when you decide that, go and grab every social media handle immediately. <laughs> and I've, you know, whether, you know, the band is going to be called Go Produce. Go grab every, the website, if you can get it, .com, instead of having to be, you know, go produce online, .web, .com, you know, go grab the name right away. Go grab the social media right away because, first of all, it's, well, not the website, but the social media, it's free. It takes you 10 minutes of your time to go grab that name. So, like, go grab that. And then if it turns out that it doesn't work out, it doesn't matter. You just kind of lose that name. But, like, if, right. if you go look, even Indie Band Guru is Indie Band Guru on every platform. And that's something I try to use an example for the bands of like, if you go to Twitter, because there's going to be fans that like Twitter, there's going to be fans that like Instagram, there's going to be fans that still use Facebook. So if you can get that name consistent everywhere, you know, that's going to take you farther. So that's one of my first things of to tell bands to do. And the second part of that, which kind of almost the same, but you got to determine your branding of what kind of band do you want to be? And that's got to come right from the start. You know, you have to have that sit down with the band, like, okay, are we going to be a mysterious band that, you know, barely shows our face? Or are we going to be an, an open, open band that, you know, shows what we're eating for lunch every day? You know, you have to determine that from the start and be consistent about it and stick together and, you know, determine that brand and stick with it. And it could change over time. Don't get me wrong. I've seen bands right. successfully change their brand, but, but pick a brand and work on that brand instead of just being all over the place, you know, cause you'll find that's where you're going to connect with people better as well. Um, yeah. No, number three, let me think of the third thing that I see so many bands are wrong at first. Um, get your, your basic foundation in order. And what that means is get your, the website is always great. And I suggest getting a website right away, but get an, a band bio together. Whether that's, you know, a friend of yours writing it for you, you could hire out and write band bios, you know, get, get a bunch of press pictures. And that could be, again, the way these iPhones are now, the cameras are great. Just have a friend, you know, take some good pictures of you, but have all those assets right away because you don't want to be scrambling when, you know, you get a great interview with Go Produce and they're like, okay, we need images and this, and then you're, shit, I got to go take some pictures. You don't have to yeah. do that. Have all that stuff ready. That foundation, I like to call it, of building that house, of having having the bio, having the press kit. Just have it all ready as soon as you can. 
So this way, when you do need it, it's right there. And it's not, it's a less stress to kind of hit you with all of a sudden. So get those cards in order. Yeah. Ooh, I experienced that for sure. That was you just described probably the last like four to six months sending out uh, playlist requests, blog posts, podcast interviews. It's like, oh, you need this and this and this and this and this, and you need an EPK. I was like, I don't even what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, so do that early. Yes, have Give it all. Have tips. it all. You know, because the music is going to be there, but having that part, though, that stuff in your bank saves you so much stress and time, you know, when you don't have it, you know, do yeah. use that time when you have it, not when you need to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. You, you, you spent some time promoting. We are, we're close ish to the end. You spent some time promoting. So I want to ask a couple of questions around that. Um, what should and shouldn't bands do when communicating with promoters? Um, that's a, the first part of that I'm going to say is, is, if we're saying promoting at a venue or whatnot, go to the yeah. venue when you're not playing or when you're not just trying to sell, just go make yourself seen. You know, you have to be part of the scene to kind of get recognized. And it becomes the same thing. Now, when I send a follow-up email to, you know, to the venue, say we want to promote a show at, I'll send that email and say, oh, I was at the show last week when this band played and they were really great. And it opens up right away. Again, that's your first paragraph, not, hey, I want to play a show there. It's like, hey, I was there. I saw this show. This was great. I really like what you're doing. It just opens up that kind of mind of the reader of the email or the phone call of, okay, this person isn't just trying to sell me something. They're part of something. And they, they want to see the – because if everyone succeeds, we all succeed. Does that make sense? A rising tide lifts all ships. So if we work Ooh, together, that. You know, if we work together, we'll all you know, we'll achieve success together as well. Very, very true. Um, and, and like, it shows the other artists that you're making the effort to actually go out as opposed to just reaching out. Right. And so meeting, that's meeting other bands who at those shows, like meet the other bands, meet the other artists, you know, and have that conversation, find out what's been working for them, what hasn't been working for them, you know, share your stories, listen to their stories, because you're going to build up your knowledge base a lot quicker than just what you're experiencing. If you get to hear what other bands are experiencing, you know, that, that saves you time and effort and money in the long run. If you yeah, know, yeah. another band that you you're similar with plays similar music tells you they were trying to book a show at this place down the road and the, you know, the booking agent's a jerk and doesn't even want to, you know, speak. I'm not going to waste my time even reaching out to that venue, you know? So it kind of, you know, saves you time, money and effort. Right. Right. By putting in, Time, money, and effort. But, and just by, <laughs> yeah, but just by kind of being sociable. And, you know, yeah. that's the thing. You're, you're out at a show, and not every every person in the band is that whole front man. I'm going to blah, blah, blah. Look look at me. I'm going to talk to everybody. But at the same time, those other guys in that other band, even when you're the shy one, they're feeling the same way. And that's what you got to put in your head. And I've, been, I've even done that over the music conferences I've been over the past five, ten years. Like, the beginning, I was like, oh, man, I'm – I'm embarrassed to go talk to these big deal people, but those big deal people just want to talk about music. So if you walk up to them and say hi and talk about music. They're more than willing to listen and more than willing to share their tips and share experiences. And, you know, I've made some great connections through the music industry just by, just by saying hi, usually over a beer, but you know, that always helps. But uh, helps. just by being, being personable and realizing that there's nothing to be afraid of because they're in the same position as you are. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wrapping up here. A lot of artists are trying to find the easy way to find success. Um, I know that you're an avid fan of easy <laughs> solutions. <laughs> um, tell me, is there an easy way? There, be is, there is no easy way. And there will be, you'll see the stories of what you think was an easy way and the band just hit it out of nowhere. But that's, that's the story that they're selling you. That band didn't start yesterday and now they're on the radio. That band was working hard under behind the scenes for years before before they hit. And there's no shortcuts to that. You're putting in the work and we'll say it this way, like luck comes to those who work for it. You know, you'll if you're willing to work and put in that work, you'll get lucky because you're in the right place at the right time because you're working. So forget about that shortcut, but put in that work and you know, the shortcuts come to those who work. Let's put it that way. You know, the shortcuts will open up and you'll make the right connection just because you were working. 
Yeah, it's true. So as you're working, you're going to encounter um, different kinds of people that will likely try and help you along your way. Some will actually, in fact, help you. But then there's a lot of artist consultants and A&R representatives and like, I'm a playlister that are just bogus. Yeah. How can you keep an eye out for these red flags to like make sure that you're doing the right work, but or you're doing the work, but you're doing the work properly and you're not getting like conned? Well, if someone reaching out to you randomly, that's a giant red flag right away. And you'll, I, I get those emails just because I'm in the music business. They send me emails like, oh, I really loved your music and we'd love to help you get on Spotify. And then, you know, I click through a few times just to see what they're trying to say. And I was like, oh, now pay us a thousand dollars and we can get you on a playlist. Like there's too much of that where be aware of the mass messages. If it yeah. looks like it's not personalized to just you, be fishy right away. You, you know, giant yeah. red flag. There's something there that they're just throwing at a thousand hooks and hoping they get a couple suckers to bite. So, you know, that's something. And to yeah. And it does. And that's the thing because it works, it brings down my whole industry of, you know, people that are really do want to do the work because they love the music because they want to help. Yeah. There's people that throw out these hooks and they make all these promises to the world and they're all BS and, but they'll get a couple people to hook and they'll hook them in for money. And then, those stories get all over when it does blow up in the artist's face. They're spreading it. Oh, all these guys are big scammers. It's not all these guys, but there are a lot of them out there. So a lot of them, yeah. be, be aware yeah. of that. And just yes. ask questions too. If, if it does even seem legit, feel free to ask the questions of who have you worked with before? Okay. Can I contact them? And if they're relative, you know, skeleton, what's the word skeptical of giving you contact information, who they worked with run the other way, because there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah. It's time. You yeah. know, you want to all, you know, all the artists I work with and all the artists I work with in the past, they're more than willing to hear from new artists that I'm thinking to work to because, you know, they like to brag about how they achieved relative success, you know, with a little help from me. So that's there all you that's, you know, another thing, but that becomes taking the work too, because no one's just going to give it to you. So when it, it looks like they're giving it to you, be, be cautious. Yeah. yeah. Be cautious. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Keith, we've got our final segments, clear the air. Clear the air. Let's stop recording. <laughs> Cut. Cut. <laughs> Oh, we make ourselves laugh. All right. Clear the air, Keith. We have a, a, a fan question. Our smartest, one of our smartest sent us a question and the grumpy sound guy has a question and then we'll be wrapping up the interview. So let me share with you the first fan question. Mm -hmm. um, this is with, oh, I can't scroll up and down here. Oh, I got it. Here is your question. Hey, Keith. How's it going? My name is Alan. I had a question. So how often... Uh, should artists be reviewing their analytics? Uh, analytics. It's definitely a giant thing in, you know, it's a great question because that's someone, you know, I didn't catch the name, but send me his info because he's someone that is diving deep into his career and realizing it's, it's a business. So analytics are something that you have to keep an eye on, but don't fall for any of the false kind of number chasing things. Uh, as far as analytics could be a lot of different things. Um, don't fall for, hey, I need, I need to grow my Instagram following by a thousand people a month just because of numbers. Those, that, that number might not matter as much as the actually how you're corresponding with these, these fans and numbers. So you right. do want to see the numbers growth in the analytics, but you want to dive a little deeper into those analytics uh, as far as... Um, Engagement. Engagement. That's the word. See, that's why you're the you're the word guy. You know, you want to want to look for that engagement because numbers don't mean anything if there's not something behind it. So follow yeah. the numbers and follow the analytics, but dive deeper into those analytics for engagement and you know what purposes of is there are they hitting certain websites? Are they hitting your sales page on your site? You know, those are the analytics to follow, not just the top level. You know, look down. And I would say you should be looking at those every month. And put that on like your calendar as a business of at the end of the month, you know, we're going to go look, look through this and see, you know, what the growth has been, what parts have risen sharply and also take into effect of what you've done over that month as to see what has made some of those spikes and what has made some of those lulls 
and kind of always be adapting and, you know, seeing what works. Um, to go too deep, as I always do, like A-B testing on like email lists. You know, if you want to follow email list analytics, you know, send two different emails with different wording, what they call a split test and send half, half your email list, this one email, half the other email and see which one gets better open rates, see which one gets better click through rates. And that's how you kind of using those analytics to try to, you know, reach the goal. Numbers don't mean anything if you're not using those numbers to get better. Right. That's awesome. Big shout out to Alan. Thank you for that question. Phenomenal no question. Phenomenal response by Keith. We've got another question by the grumpy sound guy. Oh, here comes the grump. Um, <laughs> Keith, I've seen, uh, I've seen that you have a lot of admiration towards the 90s. So you talked about Nirvana and about uh, Red Chili Peppers. I want to know where that comes from and if you could share something important um, regarding that time period sure i mean that was you're making me age myself grumpy man but um when i was you know coming out of high school was when the whole grunge revolution was kind of hitting my junior senior high school so don't do the math anyone to figure out how old that means makes me but it's and that was just kind of that's the point in your life when you know music has an opportunity to try to attach to you and then to take that further to nirvana my first real show besides a local show I saw Nirvana up at University of Buffalo, and it was just a life-changing show of just seeing a huge crowd just immersed in what they were doing on stage. And, you know, it was just, you know, life-changing. Like, wow, music does have that ability to connect people and, you know, move people. And it's just, you know, I'm like, that's where it was for me. And that, you know, Nirvana in particular will still always remain my favorite band to this day. That's awesome. It's 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 beautiful when these have, bands uh, oh, have people told you that you look like David Draymond they, or not? No, I, I the guy from from Disturbed. Yeah, well, I used to have the the beard a little longer, so I have heard that. I've also heard of look like when I had, I had a long long goatee at one point. I was told I look like Scotty and from Anthrax a lot. So, you know, <laughs> a lot of metal guys they throw me in with. So, and metal's not yeah, even not my 90s. forte. So. <laughs> the 90s look yeah i'm holding on to it except for the hair that fell out but <laughs> it's uh it's the more modern look you know that's it that's it hey, keep it, keep like it, it smooth and you know it works well <laughs> less to work with lou, lou can relate so <laughs> yes yes give me less i need simplicity in my life um thank you grumpy sound guy for your for your question and keith for your response grumpy do you have any final words as we wrap this up <laughs> All righty, Keith, do you have any final words? I'm just going to put out there, just be willing to put in hard work in whatever you're doing and go for it. You know, no holding back. Do what you want to do and just be willing to put in the work. That's all I got to say. You got to put in the work. You got to put in the work. Um, where can we find your resources? Um, like I mentioned earlier, Indie Band Guru, I-N-D-I-E. You know, a lot of non-musicians don't get that and they would have put a Y in there. It's I-N-D-I-E, bandguru.com uh, on every social media platform. I love, you know, talking to musicians and artists. So feel free to shoot me questions on any social media platform through the contact form on the website. You know, I'm, and I'm not saying I'm going to try to hook you into a big artist development contract. No, I'm, I love answering questions about music. And if we connect, then we can take it further. But, you know, feel free to ask me anything and I'll do my best to give you some answers. That's super awesome. I will make sure to include all of those notes and uh, links in the show notes. Um, Keith, I just wanted to say thank you so much. That is it for this episode. Smartest, if you want to connect with me or other like-minded individuals, then also uh, find us on Facebook, goproduce.ca forward slash groups. I will include that in, this, in, this, in the notes as well because I'm stuttering a little bit for some reason. But this is where we're going to share all of our resources. We're going to have some fun. My name is Big Lou. I want to see you there. This is Go Produce. We out.